Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to the 2014 Royal Tyrrell Museum Speaker Series. Today the Royal Tyrrell Museum and its cooperating society are proud to present Mr. Tim Showalter. Tim is a retired wildlife biologist and educator who lives near Michichi, Alberta. Tim was raised on a farm in the Rumsey area where his family encouraged interest in wildlife, fossils and archaeology. While in high school, he worked during the summers for the University of Alberta, participating in archaeological and paleontological digs. He continued this part-time and summer employment in the vertebrate paleontology lab at the University of Alberta while pursuing his undergraduate degree. After graduating, Tim began an extremely varied career, first working with birds of prey for the Canadian Wildlife Service, and then working for Alberta Fish and Wildlife. It was during this time that he developed an interest in small mammals and in the use of owl pellets as a method of determining um, the presence of small mammals in an area. Subsequently, his interest in wildlife, fossils, and archaeology merged when he was hired by the Archaeological Survey of Alberta. As their faunal analyst, Tim identified bones from archaeological sites, investigated evidence of butchering and processing patterns, and determined the age of mammals hunted by aboriginal, aboriginal people and early European settlers, as well as the season of the kill. After that time, uh, Tim spent five years working as a collections technician here at the Royal Tyrrell Museum. For him, it was the best job in the museum as he got to see and catalog the entire scope of the museum's collections. After leaving the museum, Tim taught wildlife and fisheries sciences at Lakeland College in Vermilion, Alberta. Tim is currently a director with the Delia Historical Society, the Bow Valley Propane Cooperative, and the Buffalo Lake Naturalist Club. His current interests include identifying prey remains and owl pellets and the natural history and geography of the Hand Hills, and his skills are frequently called upon by researchers from University in Saskatchewan, the Royal Alberta Museum, and even here at the Royal Tyrrell Museum. Today, Tim will present his latest scientific contribution, a revision of the mammals present in the Drumheller region, a publication that will soon be available through the Royal Alberta Museum website. So without further delay, I present you Mr. Tim Showalter. Uh, thank you, Francois. And I uh, particularly thank you for not mentioning oh, uh, dates on some of those things. But then maybe again, I've, uh, maybe it sounds like uh, I've done a lot for a guy who's 140 years old. So I, I'm not sure if that was good or not. Uh, 22 years ago now, uh, Hugh Smith, who is the curator of mammals at what was then the Provincial Museum of Alberta, published uh, um, a, a document on uh, the mammals of the Dermheller area. And it was Hugh's idea to establish the baseline information that could be used by in the future to uh, monitor changes in the mammalian populations in the area. A very good idea, and a good idea that I've been uh, privileged to follow up uh, here 22 years later. And you'll notice, of course, it took seven of us to do the job. Uh, and that's partly because there's been a great growth in the knowledge uh, about the mammals of the area. And we've added seven new species, so there's now 59 known to have occurred here historically. And uh, uh, it's not all of them occur here anymore. Uh, two of those uh, are introduced species that uh, wouldn't occur here naturally, obviously, house mouse and, and gray squirrels that you're familiar with. And also there have been some real changes in the mammalian populations as well. Just to introduce some of the characters in the, of the cast here, the familiar deer mouse, uh, most of you will, I assume know that. This is a uh, big-eyed creature, big ears, long bicolored tail. If you're working on owl pellets, that's what a deer mouse looks like. This is the front of the jaw here. This is that continuous growing incisor that you heard about rodents having. One of the three teeth in the jaw and the back of the jaw here. The animal above it, this is what it looks like again on the owl pellet, it's something called the grasshopper mouse, uh, something of conservation concern in the province. Uh, looks very much like a deer mouse, has a shorter tail and a, a really robust tough mouse. It's actually considered to be a carnivorous mouse and will eat deer mice given the opportunity. And uh, you notice the large muscle attachments, bigger teeth, and again, the incisor here. Quite a distinctive animal. Another animal most of you will be familiar with is a meadow vole. Uh, a lot of the people also refer to this as a, uh, 
a field mouse or something like that, short tail, rather large uh, vole, say about that long, excluding the tail. These are the things that make a mess in your lawn over the winter under the snow. So some of you probably have gone out there and found runways and balls of grass and grass dug up and things like that under your lawn. Or if you're from the, on the farm, these are the ones the hawks go after, jumping in parts of your, your machinery to get as you're doing the haying or lifting the bales. One you may not have heard of, which is actually a common animal in this area, is a sagebrush vole. And it's a vole with a very pale looking vole, very short tail, as you can see here. Again, the voles have very tiny ears. This is the skull here from the bottom, the front teeth up here. Voles have kind of a zigzag pattern on their teeth and they wear flat, unlike our teeth. Uh, so that's what makes them quite, uh, uh, as a group, voles. Uh, and this particular vole has very large uh, auditory regions in it. This is expanded quite a bit. You can see kind of a funny, soft, uh, spongy bone there. This is the animal, the small animal we have here that will run around in broad daylight in almost bare ground. Okay, and so it is probably very sensitive to hearing uh, because uh, to hear predators coming at it. Shrews is another group I'll be mentioning if you're not, and you'll sometimes find these, your cats will bring them home. It's got this animal with a pointed nose, very fragile looking limbs. And this is a skull of one down here. This is a millimeter scale. You can see they're quite tiny animals, fragile looking animals. Big cranium on it, big brain case on them relative size of the animal. They may well be very smart, but they're so different than us, it's hard for us to figure that out. The two main characters that we're looking at here, of course, are the burrowing owl, and I've had the luck to actually do a lot of work with burrowing owls. You can, these are tiny owls. You can take a Minute Maid can, cut a slot down one side and pop these guys in head first and have a wing sticking out one side and their tail and their feet are all sticking out the back. You can band them, do some measurements and things like that when you do that, and they're calmer in there while you do it. But they are quite small owls, of course, as you know, live in burrows. Most of the work with owl pallets done here is with uh, great horned owls. And this obviously is one, some in a pair, the adult and juvenile below it. And they actually use buildings an awful lot in our area. And so what a great horned owl will do is that it will uh, first take a mouse or and maybe a piece of a larger prey, but they swallow it whole head first and it goes into the stomach, and there it gets digested by the acids in the stomach, and so what is left over is the hair and bone, or if it's a bird, the feathers, or a fish, it'll be uh, scales or insect, we'll of course leave the insect parts there. That eventually wads up and a couple of times a day, depending on what the owl's eating, the owl will bring it up, the technical word is cast, Although I can assure you, uh, having done a lot of work with upper elementary and junior high classes, that's not a word you hear very often when they're, uh, you hear this, uh, describing this process. But uh, the pellets, of course, being out of the weather here, in this case, largely out of the weather, pile up below where the owl roosts. This is, a, uh, this is the mother load here. I mean, it's not very often you actually get a heap of them like that. More typically, you'll get a few dozen at best pellets. And so what that would look like there is, uh, you can see these pellets here, and uh, I would collect those, but also you can see all the bones, because that site was obviously partly in the weather, and so that heap consisted of basically a pile of bones, hair, and uh, feather remains. And so in that site, probably a decade or 15 years of owl pellet accumulation with, I don't know, certainly thousands of individual animals in it, I would take enough so I could probably get about 500 from animals uh, from that site. Uh, and then it's just, you need, you, you can't spend all your time working on one spot, so you go to the next one. Give you some idea of the size of these things. I guess I could have put a knife and fork beside that, but. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, so what you do is three different ways of doing it. One of which, if you have a relatively small number of pellets, you can get a jeweler's visor with some magnification on it, pick them apart mechanically with dental tools, forceps, identify the pieces that come out. Uh, 
if you have dealing with larger numbers, you dissolve the hair and feathers in a solution of, uh, of uh, sodium hydroxide, grain cleaner, and you got to watch it a little bit, but it works great. We dry, rinse and dry stuff out, and then you can sort it relatively quickly. Again, with jewelry visors sticking the shrewd teeth and what, and some of the metal, uh, some of the voles under the a microscope to identify them. Or if I get a little sl slack, you, I just leave them in a paper bag in the shop and forget about them for a while. And I do mean forget about them. When you go back, and the moth larvae have gotten in there, and have eaten all the. Uh, uh, feathers and hair, and they do a nice job, but they leave a horrible mess of frass and silk and stuff in there. Uh, but all those ways work, and so if you're thinking about doing it, anything I take into the classroom, of course, you autoclave to, to knock out some of the nasties, so you need, uh, because there's, uh, obviously, uh, there can be fungus and things like that, given these things are moist when they're dropped on the ground, and so you have to be a little concerned with that if you're doing it. Well, what kind of stuff do you find? Well, you find some really cool stuff. Uh, and you learn some really cool things. Uh, a, a species of conservation concern in Alberta is a spadefoot toad. As it turns out, spadefoot toads are quite widely distributed. Uh, now, the be you, don't, you wouldn't ordinarily use, and this is a spadefoot toad bone here, you wouldn't ordinarily use uh, owl pellets to look for spadefoot toads because the best way, of course, is to go out after a rain and listen for them, and they're singing their heads off. But there's only so many biologists with only so much time to go out. And so we routinely find, particularly in the burrowing owl pellets, spadefoot toad records that are of interest to the biologists working on these things. Uh, so in the case of this animal, this particular individual here, this one's from Dorothy. And this is the closest spadefoot toad record to Drumheller. So the biologists who are concerned with spadefoot toads know they can start at Dorothy after a rain and work their way here if they're interested in the distribution of spadefoot toads, because as far as we know, there are none here. Uh, some, some very useful information there, very odd-looking bones they have as well. I was really surprised when I started, did some work in Grasslands National Park in Saskatchewan to discover that the owls were routinely taking crayfish. And which was, I shouldn't have been surprised because in some of the sites, uh, like on the Rosebud River, one comes to mind, that owl there was taking suckers like crazy, and th its number one prey was suckers. And if you do occasionally see, I haven't seen this myself, but other people have reported that the great horned owls will splash into the water kind of up on their legs there and be thrashing around after something, and so they actually do hunt in the water uh, and take things out there too, and it's something I learned that way. And then particularly with the uh, burrowing owl pellets, there are just some very cool things in there. This is, a, I think, a jeweled carabid is the common name of it. This, uh, this is a wing carapace of the back of a, uh, a carapace from the back of a, a beetle. And it's got these interesting jewel-like indentations on it. Uh, not that I ever get bored doing this, but if I ever see a chunk of a um, scorpion in there, I rummage around and drag out the UV lamp, and because scorpion pieces glow magnificently under UV light. And you can hold it over the sample and see all these little spots of uh, scorpion chunks that you missed when you sorted through the first time. Um, other cool things, um, and uh, some quite rare things, um, uh, horned lizards, uh, some interesting records of snakes from Saskatchewan, um, and so forth. So you do, you do routinely uh, find these things, and it actually keeps you going pretty well, is the sort of anticipation of some very interesting things. A good example, and I'll take an example for, from Saskatchewan for a reason that'll become evident in a minute here. Looking at great horn pellets down here, we came across, this is the first specimen of this animal here, a bushy-tailed wood rat. And as we went through more of the owl pellets from this spot down here, this is in Grasslands National Park, the Frenchman River here, within a kilometer of the international boundary. Uh, this is the only established record of a breeding population of wood rats in Saskatchewan. Uh, as it often turns out with these cases, it was not uh, completely new because one of the wardens at the park knew there was wood rats there because he came from an area where the wood rats recognized the animals but didn't know, in fact, that that was unusual in Saskatchewan. And so that actually happens quite commonly that people have knowledge 
And I think there's probably a lot of people here, and given the amount of field work people have done here, that actually is of real value to people uh, doing conservation work or natural history records. And I mention that, of course, because there's uh, some people here work along the Frenchman River here, and you may well be seeing wood rats further upstream. A very useful contribution if you could contact the, if you see them, the Royal Saskatchewan Museum, or if you inclined that way, stick a note in something like the Blue Jay. Fun, quick to do. Further, over here, not shown on this map, there's this tiny little loop the South Saskatchewan River makes into Saskatchewan, back into Alberta, and, bef and then back again to join up with the Red Deer River. On that tiny little loop down here, there's a decent looking badlands. I've never actually gotten over to see them. Somebody here is likely to someday. There are, on the Alberta side, uh, Corey Lawson, one of the co-authors on here, found a, a very healthy, very isolated wood rat population there. And almost certainly they occur in Saskatchewan up here as well. So there's probably the two places in Saskatchewan that wood rats occur. And it's again the kind of records that some people here are probably in the best position to make the observations. Okay, talking about the Drumheller region, let's talk a little bit about what we here. It's actually what Hugh Smith did was took the, the National Topographic Graphic Sheet, the Drumheller map sheet, I think it's 82N or P, I can't remember, and say this is the area I'm interested in. A very good area, of course, up here. Uh, heavy, well-defined uh, aspen parklands with other trees down here, and then by the time you get down to this corner, uh, reasonably arid prairie. Uh, some urban parts in it, some irrigated parts, uh, some fairly large areas of native uh, habitat, uh, and other areas have been highly modified. An excellent area to look for changes, right? Uh, that's just if we're going to see them, you know, it's a kind of that transition there. Uh, you can see roughly where the boundaries are, Innisfail, south of Big Valley, Sullivan Lake, south, sort of this side of Hannah along Highway 36 south, just north of Gem down here, back again to what used to be eastern Calgary, uh, and just south of Highway 1 uh, through Strathmore there, and then of course up along Highway 2. About 15,000 square kilometers, a manageable something that you can take on. Doing what we did for the province, it would be a, a tremendous uh, job. The yellow dots indicate where we have specimens, uh, records on our maps, or refer to them in the text. Most of these are owl pellet sites, but some of them are actual uh, museum traffic records. The Red Deer River Valley here has been a real magnet for collectors. Some, uh, some of these dots over here are from um, also expeditions to the Hand Hills, which has also attracted a lot of it. Truth of it is, there hasn't been a lot of systematic mammal survey work done in the rest of this area. And I'll, you'll get by the time I'm done the idea that we your, what I assume most of you would think that our mammals, knowledge of the small mammals in Alberta is actually pretty good, it isn't. And, uh, and, there's, and we, ha we are information deficient on these animals as a group. And looking at the first one, sage rush wool, the animal that uh, I mentioned talked about the skull a little bit. Um, this is the pellet records from the owl pellets are shown here. And then we have all these triangles here, and the stars indicate where the specimen record's from. This one's of interest uh, to me, because of course those are my records, and I'll talk about that a little more, and I made those fairly recently. But there's also here this record. Uh, I can't recall when it was, but the earlier paleontological expeditions, the crews that came out here looking for fossils, actually were biophysical surveys, clearly focused on collecting fossils. But one of the things I found interesting as I got into more and more working with modern animals was I was coming across records of, of names of people I had known as fossil collectors who were recorded as collectors or photographers of things. So this sagebrush wool was for many, many years the only record of a sagebrush wool from this part of the province, assumably an isolated record. Uh, in 1917, there was another sage rush wool collected by a paleontological expedition from a hawk's nest on Sand Creek, which is now in Dinosaur Park. And until 1927, some people will tell you, some people will tell you it's actually two other records, 
but until 1927, that, that was the only record of a sagebrush roll from, the, what, from Alberta. And that was, that was, those were made, that was a record made by a paleontologist. Uh, C. M. Sternberg's name comes up if you're flipping through some of the old ornithological records. Not that he published a lot in birds, but his pictures, particularly of Frugin's hawk nests, are, were used widely because they were the best pictures available, and he took a lot of them. Uh, so these guys actually did a lot of things other than just collect fossils when they were out here, and must have been must have been really interesting traveling with them at that time, or would have been interesting for me anyway. I say that. Anyway, you're probably getting the idea, looking at this, our actual specimen records of these things are, is inadequate. This is true of most of the province where overwhelmingly the record locations that we know about are from uh, owl pellet locations where these animals occur. Uh, I will t assure you there are plenty of them here. It's not that the owls are just picking up every one that's out there. They are common animals. And how I know that is you can find the sign of the darn things quite quickly. Uh, in, a, in an area that's eaten down, um, and this was 2002, uh, uh, the drought year in the fall, you can see these runways on this uh, uh, hilltop prairie, and where the voles have, this is their, uh, their holes to their colony or family group, depending on what it is. Uh, this is, you look on those runways, you'll see these droppings here, and these concentrations, these latrines, which they put right by their holes. So every member of that family is going out there, pooping in that pile, and uh, everybody in the whole rest of the colony has to walk over it as well. So there's some social thing going on there. But what's neat is that, look how pale those droppings are. If you think of most and vole droppings, you think of something almost black, don't you? Well, these guys eat things that other animals don't. Uh, pasture sage, this thing down here, this dwarf club moss here, you can see a little bit of growing here. And that and a few other species uh, result in their droppings being very pale. If you see these runways, if you see these pale droppings, you're dealing with sagebrush voles. And these, this sign is everywhere. I had the advantage of finally uh, being able to teach uh, our dog to, one of our dogs to actually look for colonies for me. And she could find them in, of course, very heavy cover, which I couldn't do, grass that had been growing up and hadn't been eaten for 10 or 15 years. Uh, so it's not just that they're in bare ground, they also go into bare, uh, quite heavy cover as well. There's lots of them out there. And anywhere I've been, like working on burrowing owls, you're walking across pastures and things, you find lots of sign of them. So the question is then, is why is it that when people are out trapping, they're not catching them? Lots of them there. And that is, well, I have some ideas about that. Even easier to find these things in the winter, because if you're out there hiking around, and particularly in the, when the snow is thin, they plow their runways out. In fact, they do a better job of it than any of our municipalities do. Those runways are plowed the next morning. And uh, if you're out there running around all the daytime, it's probably a good idea to have your escape route clean and ready to go. Lots of footprints here. Again, uh, earlier, you can find these things anywhere there's grassland. If you map these out, as I've done here, this gives you a rough scale in meters, you'll find that those sagebrush voles basically do not leave their runways. And they have, given that they'll eat pasture sage, salgenella, uh, which is the dwarf club moss, other things, uh, uh, prairie crocus, other things which other animals find unpalatable, they don't have to go far along their runways to find something to eat. And so they stick to them. If you're out there looking for mammals these days, you have a very standard way of doing it. The province makes you do it that way because they want you to b do it as a way so they can compare results from different researchers. If you're out there doing working for a consulting firm, so you put two traps down, go 10 meters, you put two traps down, go 10 meters. Generally, people use live traps these days. Or you can lay them out in a, in a, in a grid 10 meters apart. I, given that these animals do not go off their runways, unless you put a trap on that runway by accident, you're not going to catch it. You do catch the odd one. I mean, that's a, 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 I shouldn't say you, not a, never is a bad word, but very infrequently. 2,000 trap nights that I did up there, I caught one in traps. I actually caught more barehanded when I was out there walk checking my traps, because if these, you can see I'm, uh, one of these voles running around, if you're willing to throw yourself on the ground face first, no cactus out there, by the way. Uh, uh, you can grab them sometimes. 
Uh, and you quite, I could see, I saw quite a number of them. Uh, but they weren't being trapped there. Given the kind of food they like, probably the baits you're using, they don't like. And so this is a case of where, uh, an interesting case where there's a lot of records, of a, lot, a lot of them out there, and they're difficult to trap using our technology that we stick to them. Okay, I'll just give you an idea of what a typical sample might look like. Uh, this, there were 509 identified prey items in this. Uh, everywhere around Drumheller, almost always, deer mice are 50% roughly of the animals there. Deer mice predominate in our samples. Deer mice predominate in the um, uh, uh, trap ca captures as well. Deer mice, if you follow their tracks in the snow, move hundreds of meters at night. Deer mice are extremely curious animals. You don't even have to bait your traps. They will go investigate them and get caught. So you catch them. There's lots of them there, and, they're, and they help you out by trying to get caught. Uh, meadow voles are almost, again, generally the second most common thing in this area. And again, trapping and uh, owl pellets. Uh, from Drummerheller East here, sagebrush voles are the third most common thing, usually. Everything else kind of occurs up at sort of a higgly spiggly pattern. Some you never know in which sample you'll get them. Uh, certainly, grasshopper mice are generally occur. You generally get a few grasshopper mice uh, in most samples. Here uh, at Machichi, there are 14 species. Uh, that you're likely to catch or reasonably you expect to find in owl pellets. This particular sample captured, uh, of 509, captured 10 of those. Uh, this is a sample part. For one reason I put this on here is that Don Brinkman uh, grew up, uh, Don, I think he's here today, within, uh, if you had a stiff wind, you could throw something in the air and have it blow this far. Um, and uh, where it grew up, and uh, also it's a very, and this shows an example also of uh, a sample of owl pellets that gives you quite bizarre results, and, and I think emphasizes the, the dangers anytime you're using one sample of anything, whether it's paleontologically, geologically, or in modern biology, you, you can get a very wrong idea of what's out there. Deer mice, again, are uh, the dominant sample here. Prairie shrews, okay, these, these things, 54 of them, and what are they? They're about uh, 235 animals. Uh, prairie shrews are tiny things, um, two and a half, maybe three grams. And that this owl went to the effort of catching so many of them was quite surprising. Uh, they hardly, and generally owls don't catch many of, of, the, of this kind of owl. Uh, some other owls catch more, but these big great horned owls hardly ever catch many shrews. Meadow voles, as you expect. Grasshopper mice, lots of them there. No sagebrush voles. This is an area, this is a building in an area that's been cultivated at one time, sandy area and sown back, largely crested wheat, perfect sagebrush wool habitat. All right, this owl didn't catch any. Five species only. Uh, what's also interesting at this site, this thing was eating coarse frogs, those little tiny frogs that are so noisy in the spring. Uh, make the, t they like running your uh, finger down a comb sound. Um, and, of course, when an owl eating a coarse frog and it digests the meat away, all that's left is some bones and not a lot of them. They're tiny animals. And so a lot of them will pile up before the owl feels the need to uh, cast the pellet. So one of the pellets had 74 uh, remains of 74 coarse frogs in it. So that's a lot of work, even to get that many. There had to be a lot of them. Very, so you get some very unusual results sometimes. Continuing on with the theme of the kinds of animals that are showing up in the owl pellets that are poorly rec rec uh, recorded by regular trapping. Uh, prairie vole looks very much like a, a meadow vole, smaller animal, a paler animal. Uh, the only known from uh, owl pellet records. There's good reason to think that there's lots of them out there given these records. You'll notice also that an animal called prairie vole basically does not occur in the prairie parts of it. In, in, out here in, in Alberta, they are basically parkland animals. Uh, and over most of Alberta, where these animals are, are, are basically only known from owl pellet records. I don't really have a good explanation for that. Uh, and I think the people who deal with 
conservation of the mammals in the province is worrisome quite a bit. But on the positive side, there's obviously more of them more widely distributed than you would ordinarily think. And so this, this is a, a very positive thing. Uh, a, a, a two or three of these sites actually had more individual prairie vole remains in them than there are prairie voles in museum collections from Alberta. Uh, I probably, I hope I'm wrong about this, but I, I'm afraid I'm right. Uh, Soper wrote a book in 1964 and had a number of prairie vole records in there. Since then, there's been two specimens added as skin, museum skin specimens in from the whole of province of Alberta. One of which uh, Lorraine and my cat captured at St. Paul. And an another one uh, I found dead on the uh, lawns, uh, killed by a lawnmower at the uh, uh, Vermilion uh, campus of Lakeland College. And so our ability to sample these things and, and monitor their populations is essentially non-existent. Now there's some things that owls aren't that good at sampling. Uh, this is a, a uh, western jumping mouse, long tail here. It's up on my arm not because I'm playing games with it, because it actually can. Uh, when you catch one, you hold it by its tail. It, it starts with its, its, I call them hands rather than front feet. It starts grabbing its belly and working its way up and uh, climbs hand over hand up its tail and boop, up the up top of your uh, hand. Uh, fortunately, they're very passive, gentle animals. Probably would make quite decent pets. So uh, this thing had climbed up my hand and uh, uh, wound up uh, there. Owls don't catch many of these. Great horned owls don't. Now, if you go east of Edmonton, looking at saw-wet owls, uh, looking at a different species of jumping mouse. Um, in those nest box for saw-wet owls, if you open them up when you're cleaning out the nest box, you look in there and you think you may have a bunch of gray spaghetti in there because there's a mess of tails. They're crisscrossed like that in there. But these are rare in owl pallets down here and difficult to collect, trapping them. I saw more one's running around. I saw 14 while I was checking my traps. You're out there at the crack of dawn, you're using live traps. You minimize it there, you, so you're out there early checking your traps. There was, I, th I caught 11 of these animals in the traps in 2000 trap nights. There was, I saw 14. We saw more in the yard. The neighbors were bringing them to me. Uh, so these are probably fairly common animals. Neither owl pellets or trapping in this area adequately sample them. We have this animal, a red back vole, uh, named for obvious names. You can see them at our bird feeder. When I was trapping in the area, you, you caught all kinds of them in the trees. Uh, in, um, in, the, in our trees also there, there are a, a couple of, uh, several times, the owls have nested in those trees, and the male actually, where they roost, is where most of the pellets are. There's very few pellets under the actual nest where the baby owls are. Most of them are under the male's roost. Uh, and so I've looked at a lot of pellets, zero. That's how many uh, of these redback voles are in those owl pellets, despite the fact all that owl has to do is look down at the ground and see them walking underneath its roost during the night. It's not catching them. Uh, I don't have an explanation for that. Uh, so they're, and they're easy to trap. So in this case, trapping is the way to go if you are interested in, in looking at those animals, their distribution. Shrews, uh, people trapping don't catch a lot of shrews. Owls don't catch a lot of shrews. And I'll make a case that if you find a dead shrew, and, and you'll quite often do either when you're out hiking around the winter, cats bring them in, particularly along the international boundary. Uh, it's a good idea if you could put, get it into a bag of some decent shape with a label on it, who, what, where, when, why, the usual stuff you put on a label, into a freezer and get it to the Alberta Museum, and it's a, a good likelihood that it'll be a worthwhile record, and they will add it to their collection. And there's a decent likelihood that if you're working along the international boundary, you will catch, ha, will have caught one of the two species that occurs in Montana that we have every reason for thinking that occurs in Alberta here, but we haven't captured yet. And so it's another thing when you're out there hiking around, uh, you be, need to be aware of. This one happens to be of a, a water shrew. One water shrew at Machichi, and the next water shrew we know of is somewhere up around El Nora, up, um, um, west of Big Valley, kind of over in that area, up a big gap there. I don't know if they are found here in the valley or not. 
Uh, but again, our shrews, our knowledge of shrews is such that that's not that unusual to have these huge gaps in the distribution records. Just talk, one of the, uh, Drumheller is a hot spot for bats. The valley up and down stream here, well known for bats. It's a magnet for the researchers that come out of Robert Barclay's lab in the University of Calgary. They have different students who spent a great deal of time studying bats in this area, right in the valley here, uh, and learned all kinds of stuff about them. Perhaps the coolest thing was that, well, one of the things that I mentioned, Corey Lawson again, this is one of her, her, probably her big discovery. This is a big brown bat. And this is what they call a western small-footed bat, and a third species of bat gives here. Uh, and she found out some interesting things about them. Big brown bats we knew overwintered here. And in fact, they're the only bat that we have that can tolerate our super dry weather we get in our, wet in, in our buildings in the winter. If you see a bat flying around in here right now, it's a big brown bat. Don't say it can't happen, because it's the perfect place for them to overwinter. Um, the other two species, we had no idea where they overwintered. Tiny bats, we assumed that they would be at risk of dehydrating because of their large surface areas. She found that not only do they winter here, they come out in the winter. So a night, like even last night, I'm like, maybe I don't know if they come out with that kind of wind, she put out her bat detectors and she can detect this three species of bats flying around at minus three, plus one kinds of temperatures in the winter. And that was work was done at East Cooley and re replicated again in Dinosaur Park. Um, completely unexpected. No real explanation for it. They do this routinely. An animal we have at Machichi that you don't get down here. Okay, lots of these, right? Everybody's seen cottontails. At Machichi right now and last winter we are dealing with a mess of these animals. This is a snowshoe hare, one, one young of the year. One of the reasons some, uh, that they may not be recognized here in the valley is that when this thing is brown a little earlier, they look fairly much like uh, cottontails, and the young aren't all that much bigger than a cottontail. However, I think the adults turning white in the winter, and with their huge feet, people would have recognized. Uh, and so we, uh, and I was surprised to learn, and we've learned the hard way that You've heard of these snowshoe hares. Those are the animals that undergo these enormous population swings. And um, uh, I'll, if there's a question about it, I'm going to pass it on to Earl and Todd who's here today because he knows a lot more about it than I do. But occur in the boreal forest. Well, they also do that in the very edge of their range around here. And so, uh, and if you're not watching your, your thing there, just go back here one. I mean, they're cute, eh? And look at those huge feet on this thing. And that's our, our, our in front of our shop there. They're kind of charming animals, funny clumsy things with their big feet. Uh, but man, when you get to be numerous, they hit her pretty hard, eh? This is what our orchard looked like here late last winter. I hadn't been out there for three weeks. Those are used to be our apple trees. Uh, and some patches of the uh, poplar clones around, they wiped out everything that was probably younger in seven years. All these trees are girdled. Uh, it's not fatal for a poplar clone to do that because stuff comes up from the ground again, but it set back the growth. Trees don't grow that fast up there. Uh, here's one up, reared up on his back legs, working over, trying to get at uh, some uh, branches of a thorny buffaloberry. The snow was a little deeper earlier, and so this is where the browse line is on there, where they could reach. And you'll notice again, they've girdled, gone all the way around, eating the bark off, killing those little trees uh, at this little place. And one of the things that's really interesting about it and got me thinking that these small mammals can have a big impact that we're not even aware of on what's growing out there. Uh, in other places, they found that if you fence off areas, uh, in Arizona particularly true, you actually get a very different pattern of growth. In fact, the grass in Arizona used to be grass. And the grass will recover in a fenced off area where there's no mice, as opposed to the area around, where it's extremely slow to recover, where the, the small animals can get, get in there and eat the seeds. May well be the case here. Nobody's ever looked at it. Another animal that's common at Machichi that does not occur in uh, Drumheller, I'm quite confident of that, although hopefully somebody will tell me I'm wrong, it's the 13 line ground squirrel. Lots of them out there. Lots of them uh, in, the, in the hand hills. Lots of them around Little Fish Lake. A family that 
Uh, many of you might be familiar with the Dooleys, who live a little downstream from here. As far as I know, when the last time I, I talked to them, and despite the fan that fact they have a lot of land up top, have never seen one of these animals. And I think most people would remember if it was the only one you ever saw. Uh, another family that lives south of Little Fish Lake, maybe 15 kilometers, don't know what I'm talking about when I ask about them, despite the fact there's that Little Fish Lake. Further uh, east of Dorothy, uh, there's some good naturalists there. They can say, we never have seen them in the yard, but eight miles north, they still use that kind of thing. Yes, I've seen them there a number of times. Uh, in the case of these guys and the snowshoe hare, Again, I mentioned Soper's 1964 book. He defines their distribution and cites examples that shows that in 1964, that distribution was basically the same as it is now. And certainly in the case of 13 line ground squirrels, it's a very well-defined edge. And there's nothing south of there for uh, 13 line ground squirrels until you get well south. And again, you people have the opportunity again, if you see 13 line ground squirrels uh, striped gophers in the southern part of the province, and they certainly are there. Again, a worthwhile natural history record. It's a different subspecies, quite a different looking animal, much paler than this, and nobody's sure where they are, how many are still left. And so that's, again, another observation that you can make of, of real value. Uh, lots of things are spreading. Uh, gray squirrels, this is obviously a black gray squirrel. Uh, they've appeared in Drumheller uh, fairly recently. Uh, Strathmore probably occupy the parts of Calgary that are in the boundaries now too. This is a species that Smith did not mention, is not mentioned, listed in uh, 1992. Red squirrels did not occur in Dry Island Buffalo Jump Park uh, when I was a kid. This one's at the Tolman Crossing uh, west of Rumsey and they're now breeding populations as far south as Morin. They're coming this way, folks, and uh, may well uh, be down here, uh, there. So there's a, an animal that is spreading. They are well known to take on these huge dispersal movements. I wouldn't be surprised if people have seen them in Drumheller. Uh, they've shown up at Finnegan, and in Saskatchewan, they've shown up on farmyards 100 kilometers at least away from where known uh, red squirrels populations breed. But if you get in a place, you hear one giving you the gears, you know how they chatter and like a machine gun, then you're probably dealing with an animal that's on territory and probably breeding. But they, uh, outside of that, you, you'll see the odd one certainly, but they're not actually established there yet. Another thing that is marching south and much to the distress of the farmers and ag fieldmen in the counties are pocket gophers. And what you're looking at here, this is one of those things if you're driving around somewhere and it's what the heck is that? And you're looking in the ditch, and because these are well, these weird dirt things lying around in the ditch. Okay, well, how they are formed is that, of course, the pocket gophers live most, spend most of their time, at least during the day, underground. And they're good tunnelers, you can see a hole there. When the ditch fills up with snow, that becomes part of their environment. And they tunnel along the bottom of the snow banks, as you can see here, and they, uh, that's what they, they forage that way as they forage underground. But they also expand their underground burrow system and they push the dirt and fill up their burrows underneath the snowbank. Of course, when the snow goes, this is what's left. And it is unless you know that, uh, as you say, what could possibly do that? These things are spreading quite rapidly. Um, they have appeared north of Delia, uh, for example, and, and you can get some pretty lively stories from the farmers because they make a mess of, the, of your alfalfa fields. They put a bunch of bumps in there. You have to go very slow. You can even wreck your machine. Not so good in your garden. They will just wipe out your row of carrots. You know how Bugs Bunny or some of the animals did that uh, in the cartoons? And just underground, and all you're left with is the tops. Uh, or they can come out at night and eat the tops, too. Uh, one of the interesting problems that is going to come with this for me is that I can go onto the handhills now, and the rest you could too, and every now and then you will see a pocket gopher bone in the bank. That is a fossil pocket gopher. You know that. It's got to be 25,000 years old. But once those animals get there, that's no longer a guaranteed thing. And so vastly complicate. And the bones are well enough preserved up there. Some of them look very fresh. Uh, because, well, I guess they spent half their time frozen. But, uh, 
uh, and, and so it can make a difference as to looking for fossils too, because if there's pocket gophers around, you wouldn't think that a bone you see could be a fossil pocket gopher. And so that, that makes quite a difference. Raccoons were here all along, have been here since Aboriginal times, uh, but they've doubtlessly increased. And in, in the last years, with the last, exception of the last two, we've had a long run of very mild winters. Uh, and so these guys, of course, are in a loft here. They are up, you can find evidence of them both above, uh, in the attics of buildings and also underneath them. Uh, certainly when I'm collecting owl pellets, find evidence of droppings in lofts and darn sure up there it's not a skunk. Uh, and so at Finnegan, these are a nuisance. Uh, you occasionally see a roadkill at East Cooley. Certainly can see their tracks up at Dry Island Buffalo Jump. And if you get up top there, they regularly routinely trash the uh, bluebird nest that people put out. And I think in the other parts of the Red Deer River drainage in the Big Valley, they're probably, in the greater sense, they're probably fairly common. Why people don't see more of them in the town here, I don't know. Uh, but they certainly are here probably in town. Outside of that, they're probably an uh, uncommon animal. I know right now at, say, Castor Coronation, they're seeing lots of them. And I think what's happened there is that they've built up for probably 20 years now. This is the first really severe winter we've had for wildlife. Even last winter was not as tough as this winter. The things are suffering out there right now. Um, and they're showing up and in poor conditions, starving at, in farmyards, looking for food. And so people are far more aware of them. They haven't suddenly increased. Very often it's because they've run out of food is when we become aware of a wildlife species in our area. Uh, this animal, lynx here, spotted in that mine. This is last week's Dermheller male. Uh, wolves, black bears, occasionally will wander into our area. There's no breeding populations of them here. These are highly mobile animals, lynx, radio collared lynx or tag lynx. Uh, was considered wildly spectacular when it was found out that they move hundreds of kilometers, but they do this quite often. And so it's not too surprising that we get the occasional one showing up here. Wolves, as you know, are, uh, can move enormous distances very quickly. Uh, black bears has only been a couple in the last 30 years that have been here. And th they have run afoul of a farmer. Uh, the last one I've heard about ran afoul of the uh, person who raises bees on a large commercially north of Delia there. And so they was trashing his beehives. Uh, there's not a lot of records of energizer buddies in the area. <laughs> <laughs> However, uh, we do have cougars here. How many? Where they are? They're here. Uh, highly mobile animals that avoid us. People certainly are seeing them, but if one shows up at East Cooley and then somebody sees one at the Morin Bridge two weeks later, you can't say for sure it's not the same animal. They are that, that kind of mobility. And, so, and given that they're secretive, they're almost impossible to count. Fortunately, we haven't had any problems here with them uh, frequently anyway, taking calves or bothering people. Uh, and I think as long as they remain at low densities, we won't. Moose have spread across the area. Uh, Hugh Smith reported they were in the Hand Hills. They were also in the very northwest part of the area. You can find them anywhere. And so the idea of a prairie moose, which was inconceivable uh, in Aboriginal times. It, I mean, I suppose the odd one went out there, but it, it just didn't, weren't there. They're well established on the prairies now. Probably habitat specialists. You can just see a little calf head sticking up here from this moose. As they're up, it's up to here in the water. and. Uh, uh, they're probably habitat specialists. Part of their habitat includes canola fields, though. And so they'll go out there and eat a lot of stuff there. In the winter, they probably have to go quite a ways to find browse. Um, up where we live, in a mild winter, they stay around all winter. They have some magic means of deciding in the last two winters that, in fact, we're going to the hand hills and we're going to yard up there with a bunch of other moose. And they're not around the house right now, but there's a mess of them in certain spots in the hand hills. Antelope, as you know, were here originally, pretty well got wiped out except for the southeast part of the area, and now have spread back basically all through the area again. Elk uh, were here in Aboriginal times in good numbers. They are now reoccupying their former range. Interesting is that generally these, these are in the wintering hills, and uh, it's the bulls. You see bulls. And so the bulls appear to be occupying an area first. There are herds with calves 
the east of Rumsey in the big uh, natural area there, and then also a small herd at uh, Dorothy. Other than that, and please somebody tell me that there's more around, uh, and we don't have breeding populations of them. We will, and the ranchers and farmers will regret it because these things are notorious for trashing haystacks. And as we get more of them, this will start to happen. But they are reoccupying their formal dish area. Oddly enough, and I was certainly surprised to learn this, and I, I did some years ago though, is that this is a, a white-tailed deer fawn. And is that white-tailed deer in Aboriginal times basically did not occur here. And so the, for example, the uh, Palliser expedition uh, overwintered in the Hand Hills in 1858-59, I think it was, did not record them here. And we're sure they didn't record them here because when they got into the foothills, they said, eh, holy Hannah, there are what they called Virginia deer here and commented on their unexpected occurrence. Uh, Lewis and Clark recorded them in Montana, again, in small numbers along the Missouri. Uh, but the, as far as we know, I'm sure given that there was populations within, uh, you know, two, a few hundred kilometers that the odd ones right through, but they, were, they weren't here. And those of you who've been around as long as I have can remember when deer were rare. You know, we used to, if you saw a deer or even saw a deer track, you'd talk about it at supper time. And now, of course, they're everywhere. Uh, and so this is a fair, these are fairly big changes that have occurred um, in, the, uh, in our fauna here. And this is perhaps a good one to end on um, because uh, like, I mean, I'll defer again to Arnold if there's questions about this, but one of the things I think has had a, ch a big impact on our wildlife here is the increase in deer numbers. And these things are getting hit on the roads regularly, as you know. And there's a lot of food in the ditches for things like coyotes, which have, are, are holding their own very, they don't, are, they're abundant year round here now. They don't suffer as much as they used in the winter because of the, of the winter there. So we have a lot of coyotes around, which can have consequences for the other thing coyotes eat, like jackrabbits. And our jackrabbits are declining. Uh, and ravens are another thing that may well be here because of all the dead stuff that uh, are lying around for short periods. I mid highways pick them up, but you've all gone by and seen ravens picking at the carcasses. Or, uh, eagles is another thing that may well be here in, uh, more abundantly in the winter than they used to be for the same reason. Okay, I'm actually, there's a mess of people I should acknowledge, and too many of them, and I would encourage you to go to the Royal Alberta Museum website, and certainly we acknowledge all of them there. But I will make an exception, and I'll, I'll always hazard to make an exception for Jovi Clack, uh, who was a designer at the museum, the Royal Alberta Museum. Uh, there was no budget for this thing for pictures, and so we gave her a really funny looking printed document with a bunch of do pretty dodgy pictures of whatever we could scrape together. And I assure you, uh, despite there was some stress in this, I assure you a good designer can save a mess, and which indeed is what she did. Uh, and so a particular compliments to Jovi for doing that, but also, again, at risk of a, a very large number of people who contributed, and obviously for something like this. Okay, thank you.